should not single out any one instruction, but instead apply these instructions as a whole to the evidence in this case. In order to reach a fair and just verdict, you must understand and follow the law as I explain it to you. For example, you have to understand the definition of the crime with which the defendant is charged. You have to understand how convinced one way or the other you should be before you reach your verdict. And you have to understand what to consider in deciding whether to believe a particular witness. These instructions will explain the law as to these and other matters so that you can reach a fair and just verdict. It is your duty as jurors to follow all of the instructions I'm about to give you, regardless of any opinions you may have as to what the law is or the law ought to be. The law, as I give it to you in these instructions, is the law that you must follow in reaching your verdict. It is up to you to decide the facts of this case. You and you alone are the judges of the facts. You apply the facts as you find them to be to the law as I give it to you in these instructions, and in this way you reach your verdict. You should decide the facts in this case without prejudice, without fear, and without sympathy. Throughout the trial, I must be fair and impartial just as you are required to be. <clears throat> Therefore, if I said or did anything during the trial that causes you to believe that I favor one party over the other, I now instruct you that I do not favor either party in this case. You and you alone, as I said, are the judges of the facts, and you decide the verdict. The role of the judge is to run the trial in a fair and orderly manner, to decide the admissibility of evidence, and to, to instruct you, the jury, on the law that applies to the case. Please do not place any emphasis on my note-taking during the trial, because, as I have explained, our roles are quite different. You were to decide the facts based only on the evidence, and the evidence in this case was the testimony under oath of the witnesses and any exhibits which were admitted into evidence. Those exhibits will go with you into the jury deliberation room. There are certain other matters that you may not consider as evidence. The fact that the defendant has been charged in a complaint is not evidence of her guilt. A complaint is simply a way of giving the defendant notice of the accusations against her. A complaint is a formal way of accusing her of a crime in order to bring her to trial and you must not consider the complaint as evidence of guilt of the defendant. The possible punishment of the defendant if you return a guilty verdict should not influence your decision. The duty of imposing sentence is solely for the judge. You should consider the evidence presented and base your verdict only on the evidence without considering the issue of punishment. A defendant, although accused, begins a trial with a clean slate with no evidence against her. The law permits nothing but the admissible evidence presented before you to be considered in support of the charges against her. The law presumes every defendant to be innocent until proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. The burden of proof rests entirely on the state. A defendant does not have to present evidence or prove her innocence. A defendant enters the courtroom as an innocent person and is presumed innocent until the state convinces you beyond a reasonable doubt that she is guilty of every essential element of the offense charged. That presumption means that you are to regard the defendant in this case as innocent unless the state proves beyond a reasonable doubt that she is guilty. A person accused of a crime has an absolute right not to take the stand to testify. The fact that the defendant did not testify must not be considered by you in any way in deciding this case. The burden is on the state to prove the defendant guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. The defendant has no obligation to present any evidence or prove her innocence. As I explained in my initial instructions, what the prosecutor and the defendant say to you in their opening statements and closing arguments is not evidence. In their opening statements and their closing arguments, they attempt to help you understand the evidence from their point of view. But what they say to you in these arguments is not evidence in the case. If the prosecutor and or the defendant have stated the law differently from the law as I explained it to you in these instructions, then you must disregard what they have said about the law and follow my instructions. Similarly, if during argument they have stated the facts differently from the way you recollect them to be, based upon your recollection of the testimony offered during the trial, then you should disregard what they have said about the facts and follow your own recollection. During the trial, the prosecutor and or the defendant made objections. Litigants are supposed to object when they believe that certain evidence may not be admissible under our rules of evidence. Do not hold these objections against either party. Sometimes these objections require bench conferences. If I sustained an objection and I excluded any evidence, you must not guess as to what that evidence might have been. If I overruled an objection and allowed certain evidence to be admitted, you must not give that evidence any special weight as a result of my ruling. You should consider only the legally admissible evidence, in short, the testimony of witnesses under oath and the exhibits that were admitted into evidence. Now, there are two kinds of evidence, direct and circumstantial. Direct evidence is direct proof of a fact, 
such as the testimony or statement of a person about what the person saw, heard, or did. Circumstantial evidence is indirect evidence, that is, proof of a chain of facts from which you could find that another fact exists, although it, is not, although it has not been proved directly. As an example of direct and circumstantial, pardon me, an example of direct and circumstantial evidence is always helpful. Assume, if you would, that you were about to go on vacation, and before you leave, you pass your neighbor's house, which is the color white. When you return from vacation, you notice that your neighbor's house is now the color brown. You use this color change as circumstantial evidence that while you were on vacation, someone painted your neighbor's house, even though you did not actually see it happen. If you had actually seen someone painting your neighbor's house, that would be direct evidence. You should feel fee free to reach reasonable conclusions from proven facts, but you may not reach conclusions on facts that have not been proved. You should consider both kinds of evidence. You are permitted to give equal weight to both, but it is for you to decide how much weight to give any evidence, whether it is direct or circumstantial. However, to be sufficient to establish guilt beyond a reasonable doubt, circumstantial evidence must exclude all other <coughs> rational conclusions. This means that if, from the circumstantial evidence, it is reasonable, it is rational to arrive at two conclusions, one consistent with guilt and one consistent with innocence, then you must choose the rational conclusion consistent with innocence. However, do not consider each item of circumstantial evidence in isolation. In determining whether all other rational conclusions have been excluded, you should consider each item of circumstantial evidence in the context of all the other evidence, which includes all other circumstantial evidence and direct evidence. You should consider all the direct and circumstantial evidence in the case, as well as any reasonable inferences you draw from that evidence, in deciding whether the state has proved all the elements of the crime charged beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, in reviewing the evidence, you should consider the quality of the evidence and not the quantity. It is not the number of witnesses nor the quantity of the evidence that is important, but the quality of the evidence. That is how satisfying and persuasive the evidence is to you. In deciding whether the state has proven the charges against the, the charge, pardon me, against the defendant beyond a reasonable doubt, you must consider the credibility of witnesses. That is, it is up to you to decide who to believe. If there is any conflict between the witnesses, then you must resolve the conflict and decide what the truth is. Simply because a witness has taken an oath to tell the truth does not mean that you have to accept the testimony is true. In deciding what witnesses to believe, you should use your common sense and judgment and I suggest you consider a number of factors. The witness's age, intelligence, and experience. Whether the witness appeared to be candid. Whether the witness appeared worthy of belief. The accuracy of the witness's memory. The appearance and demeanor of the witness while testifying. Whether the witness has an interest in the outcome of the case. Whether the witness has any reason for not telling the truth. Whether what the witness said seemed reasonable or probable. Whether what the witness said seemed unreasonable or inconsistent with the other evidence in the case and whether the witness had any friendship or animosity towards other people in the case. You should consider these factors in deciding the credibility of all witnesses, whether they happen to be ordinary citizens or police officers. In short, you should consider the testimony of each witness and give it the weight that you think it deserves. You can accept all of what a witness says, you can reject all of what a witness says, or you can accept some of it and reject some of it. It's up to you. In deciding whether to believe a witness and how much of his or her testimony to believe, you should consider both the direct and cross-examination of the witness. You need not believe a witness's testimony simply because it is uncontradicted. As I said, the determination of witness credibility is up to you. In deciding whether you believe a witness, you may consider whether the witness made statements before trial which were not consistent with what the witness said at trial. If the witness made an inconsistent statement before trial, you may use that statement in deciding whether to believe the witness. You may not use the statement made before trial as proof that the facts in the statement are true. The statement made before trial is only to be used by you in deciding whether to believe a witness. Now, I've addressed what you should not consider and what you should consider in reaching a verdict. I'm now going to discuss how convinced one way or the other you must be, and this is referred to as the burden of proof. Under our constitutions, all defendants in criminal cases are presumed to be innocent until proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. The burden of proving guilt is entirely on the state. The defendant does not have to prove her innocence. As I told you earlier, she enters this courtroom an innocent person, and you must consider her to be an innocent person until the state convinces you beyond a reasonable doubt that she is guilty of every element of the alleged offense. If, after all the evidence and arguments, 
you have a reasonable doubt as to the defendant having committed one or more elements of the offense, then you must find her not guilty. Members of the jury, a reasonable doubt is just what the words would ordinarily imply. The use of the word reasonable means simply that the doubt must be reasonable rather than unreasonable. It must be a doubt based on reason. It is not a fanciful or frivolous doubt, nor is it one that can be easily explained away. Rather, it is such a doubt based on reason as remains after consideration of all the evidence that the state has offered against it. The test you must use is this. If you have a reasonable doubt as to whether the state has proved any one or more of the elements of the crime charged, you must find the defendant not guilty. However, if you find the state has proved all of the elements of the offense charged beyond a reasonable doubt, you should find the defendant guilty. Please remember that in order to reach a verdict in this case, whether it is guilty or not guilty, your verdict must be unanimous. I'm not going to discuss the definition of the crime with which the defendant is charged. A crime is any breaking of a law for which the law provides punishment. All crimes have at least two parts, an intent and an act. In deciding whether a person is guilty of a crime, it is absolutely necessary for you to know both what the person's actions were and what her intentions were. The word intent refers to what a person mentally believed her physical acts will accomplish, and the word act refers to a physical deed. The state has the burden of proving beyond a reasonable doubt a separate intent and a separate act for each crime charged. Thus, for a person to be guilty of a crime, she must have done the following two things. She must have mentally intended to do something that is criminal, and she must have physically acted to do something that is criminal. Unless a person both intended and acted to do something criminal, that person has not committed a crime. Many people do not realize that sometimes the only reason two identical acts are given different names is that they refer to different intentions. For example, assume that two drivers of automobiles hit a person crossing the street. If one of the drivers intended to hit the pedestrian and the other one did so recklessly, they would not be charged with the same crime because while they both committed the same act, they had different mental states. Now, whether the defendant acted with the required intent is a question of fact for you to decide. Keep in mind that there is often no direct evidence of intent because there is no way of examining the operation of a person's mind. You should consider all the facts and circumstances and evidence in deciding whether or not the state has proved that the defendant acted with the required intent. Charge number 571918C alleges that the defendant committed the crime of resisting arrest or detention in that she knowingly interfered with a person she recognized to be a law enforcement officer, official seeking to effect her arrest when she struggled with Officer Elston, Sergeant Mucci, and Sergeant Patty as they attempted to handcuff her. The definition of this crime has four parts or elements. The state must prove each element beyond a reasonable doubt. Thus, the state must prove that one, the defendant physically interfered with another person, and two, the defendant knew the other person was a law enforcement official. And three, the official was trying to arrest or detain the defendant. And four, the defendant acted knowingly. These are the elements of the crime of resisting arrest or detention. Certain terms in the definition need to be further defined. With respect to the first part or element, as indicated, the interference must be physical. Verbal protests alone do not constitute resisting arrest or detention. With respect to the third part or element, it does not matter whether the arrest or detention was illegal. The state does not have to prove that there was a valid legal basis for the arrest or detention. Law enforcement officials are justified in using non-deadly force upon another person when, and to the extent they reasonably believed it necessary to effect an arrest or detention, unless the officers know that the arrest or detention is illegal. The fourth part or element refers to the defendant's mental state. A person acts knowingly when she is aware of the nature of her conduct. The state does not have to prove that the defendant specifically intended or desired a particular result. What the state must prove is that the defendant was aware that her conduct would cause the prohibited result. Whether the defendant acted knowingly is a question of fact for you to decide. Keep in mind that there is often no direct evidence of intent 
because there is no way of examining the operation of a person's mind. You should consider all the facts and circumstances and evidence in deciding whether the state has proved beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant acted knowingly. Members of the jury, the principles of law that I have given to you are intended to guide you in reaching a fair result in this case, which is important to both the parties in the courtroom and the court. You are to exercise your judgment and common sense, as I said before, without passion, without prejudice, and without sympathy, but with honesty, understanding, and due deliberation. When you have considered and weighed all the evidence, you must make one of the following findings with respect to each charge, with respect to the charge that is before you. If you have a reasonable doubt as to whether the state has proven any one or more elements of the offense charged, you must find the defendant not guilty. However, if you find that the state has proven all of the elements of the offense charged beyond a reasonable doubt, then you should find the defendant guilty. As I've said before, your verdict must be unanimous. All 12 jurors must agree on your verdict. When you have arrived at your verdict, let the bailiff know, and you will be returned to the courtroom where the foreperson will render that verdict orally in response to questions from the clerk of, that the clerk of court will ask you. The foreperson should see to it that the jury takes up the issues that are before you. He or she should see to it that each juror has a full, fair, and adequate opportunity to present his or her views, positions, and arguments with respect to the law and the evidence. You should choose the foreperson as your first order of business. Each juror's verdict must be his or her own, and it should not be made out of a need to agree with everyone else. Yet, in order to bring 12 minds to the same decisions, jurors have to respect and listen to one another's opinions honestly. I suggest that deliberation is a three-stage process. First, each juror should decide for yourself your opinions and views of the evidence in the law. Second, you should listen to what your fellow jurors have to say about the evidence in the law. Third, you should speak up and let your fellow jurors know what your opinions and views are of the evidence and the law. You should remember these two rules when you disagree with other jurors. One, respect and consider the opinions of other jurors. Two, but in the end, reach your own decision. If during deliberations it becomes necessary to communicate with me, you may do so only in writing signed by the foreperson or one or more members of the jury. Please give that note to the bailiff and he will bring it to my attention. No member of the jury should ever attempt to communicate with me except by assigned writing and I will communicate with you on anything concerning the case either in writing or orally in the courtroom. At the risk of being repetitive, let me say again that nothing said in these instructions is intended to suggest or convey in any way what your verdict should be. The verdict is exclusively your duty and your responsibility. Thank you for your attention. In a moment, I will select the alternates first. However, I would like to see the parties at the bench. <clears throat> stage. Ladies and gentlemen, I have to select two alternates. The alternates must remain in the courthouse um, in the unlikely event that we need to substitute an alternate for a juror because of illness or family emergency. That's why we ask the alternates remain. Um, I have here a container with 16 pills in it. Sometimes we have 16 jurors. We'll just draw numbers by random to, to designate the alternates. 15 doesn't work. Number eight. You just, just remain seated for a moment, ma'am. I'll tell you what, what's happening. And number six. So you two folks are alternates. That would be um, Ms. King and Ms. Uh, Escalera. Um, the bailiff will uh, take you to a different location, separate and apart from the jury. But as I said, you have to remain in the courthouse until, it, until the verdict is reached. Um, the remaining jurors shall retire now, and now, of course, not only can you talk about the case, that's really what you're supposed to do. And, oh, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, um, there's some uh, typos that I'm going to fix, but uh, you'll get a copy of the written instructions. So um, you, uh, no one really expects you to remember all that, uh, all that stuff that I just told you. Uh, would the defendant please stand and face the jury, and would the foreman please stand? 
Madam Foreman, has the jury reached a verdict in this case? Yes, we have. How say you, Madam Foreman, in charge 2011-S1052, charging defendant with resisting arrest, how do you find guilty or not guilty? We find guilty. You say, Madam Foreman, that the verdict is guilty. So say you all, ladies and gentlemen? Yes. Thank you. Yes, Uh, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, um, uh, for the service you performed, and I'll be back to speak with you shortly. All right. Sagar, so, do you want to pursue with sentencing today, or do you want some time to... Uh, today's fine. Today's fine? State of recommendation? The state was just going to ask what was imposed in the district court. Judge. What was imposed in the district? Uh, my understanding, uh, if I can read the back of the complaint correctly, is that she received 90 days suspended for a period of two years, good behavior, meaning no felony, felonies, misdemeanors, or my, my understanding, probably major motor vehicle violations would be my guess. Does she have a record? Um, I don't believe so, Judge. Sagar, how old are you? 18. She was convicted of a the disorderly conduct down below. That was the reason that she was arrested in the first place, Judge, when she... When oh, she, she didn't appeal her. that? Um, my understanding is that it was it was a violation level offense. Oh, it's a violation, violation level it's disorder. Violation level, and um, it's currently in appeal to the Supreme Court. And other than that, Judge, she has no other convictions. Anything you care to say? Well, I think that all the time and money I've spent on this is punishment enough. You're a senior in high school? Is it, do I understand that? Yes, I'm graduating next week. Okay, where are you in school? And what do you want to do with your life, Ms. Agar? What do you want to do after high school? Um, I, various things. I want to um, work and spread ideas and learn. Mm -hmm. I, I probably won't go to college, but I plan on taking various classes of things that I'm interested in learning. You know, what do you want to do? Do you have any concept of what you'd like to do? Said you want to work. Do you have any idea about what, what, how do you how like, you'd like to spend the next ten years of your life like or the a, next five years? You mean like a career? Well, not necessarily a career forever, but th what you'd like to do in the next five years? Um. Well, I, like I said, I want to take some classes and maybe. Um, well, I I'd like to work. Um, I'd be interested in working with horses if that's possible. Um, I want to continue learning and sharing ideas with other people.
I understand that, that you were seeking to make a political statement in front of the Manchester Police Department. Um, I yes? I, I don't think there was anything political about what I was doing. Like, honestly, I wasn't even aware there was a protest going on until I showed up. I was coming to Manchester to see one of my friends and visit and watch a movie or something and got a text message when I was around the area of Hookset saying that one of my friends had been arrested, so I decided to go over there and see what was going on, see when he would be released. And like, I wasn't doing anything to make a political statement. I didn't write with chalk, I didn't hold signs. I was just standing on the sidewalk. I'm going to check something. I'm going to take a 15 minute recess. We'll be back. All right. All right, would you stand, please? What I'm going to do, Ms. Agar, the, um, I, I'm reducing the district court sentence. A two years good behavior really puts you out five years to annul your conviction. You're 18 years old. Um, and I really. I want to give you the opportunity um, to seek an annulment um, and, and, and address this. Uh, the, an annulment doesn't completely wipe it off your record, but it, has, it can have very positive effect in terms of jobs and if you decide you want to go to college or you decide you want to go to a profession that requires a records check, uh, an annulment can, can really aid you in that. I don't want to see this. Um, have this kind of lifelong impact. You're 18 years old, um, and uh, uh, I, I, you're not going to listen to me because I'm old enough to be your grandfather, but I'm going to tell you this anyway, because I have a son, and I grew up in the 60s, and I understand a lot of what's going on. You have to think about what you're doing. It has, there are ramifications in life, um, and, uh, and, and there are consequences. And they can sometimes be far more, far more draconian than one can ever imagine. Um, it, it, and it's just, I don't want to see you ruin your life when it's just beginning. I, I just don't want to see you do that. You, you, you conducted yourself here uh, commendably. You, you tried the case. The jury just was very impressed with the way you handled yourself. I was as well. I thought you were respectful. I thought you. You, you did a very good job. It was impressive. Um, there's a, you have a lot going on. And I could tell just the way you've conducted yourself throughout these proceedings. This is uh, a completely foreign element to you. Um, uh, you, 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 were, you were poised. You were, you were respectful. Um, you were competent. Um, and, and I could just see that you know, there's a lot, you've got a lot of good things going on for yourself. And I just don't want to see you ruin your life. Um, uh, so, uh, I, I'm just going to give you um, a 30-day suspended sentence, that's it, um, and suspended it, and, and I'm, I'm going to suspend it um, for just a period of 30 days, um, so that at the end of 30 days, the three-year period starts to run, and, if, and you, can be, you, can, you can have your sentence annulled in, in three years from the end of the sentence. Okay, so 30 days from now, it'll be, like, the suspended sentence will no longer be... It will no longer be hanging over your head, that's correct. Okay. Um, and and I, I'm giving you... Within 30 years, within 30 days. Um, the form says years, and I just wrote 30, and I just changed it. Um, but I, I want to tell you that... Um, if you if you get yourself in more trouble um, this is on your record and 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 the judge that imposes the sentence is going to look at it um, and uh, and ultimately what happens is things become more serious and um, and all of a sudden you're tracking a criminal record that that follows you forever and and lo and behold you decide you want to be licensed to do something 
and the licensing authority looks at the record and they won't license you. And I, I don't mean just to be a lawyer or something. There, there's so many licensing restrictions. and you, you're, you're 18 years old, you have no idea what you want to do with your life. And I don't want to see this single episode having the kind of impact that can, that can affect you. But I want to tell you that if, 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 if you find yourself engaged, in, and I understand what you told me, and, I, and part, that's part of the reason why I'm doing what I'm doing. Um, but uh, the, 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 there are ways to go about civil disobedience um, if that's what you choose to do. Um, and, 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 there, and there are ways not to go about it. Um, and Can you suggest how you would go about it? Well, you know, um, you, have to, you have to think about the consequences, and you have to think about how it will impact you. Um, this, we live in a very politically correct world right now, and there are, there are substantial consequences for what people perceive when they're doing it to be insubstantial behavior. And all I can say to you is you need to think about what you're doing, and you need to think about why you're doing it. Um, and, and you need to be aware that, that it can have significant impact on your life five or 10 or 15 years down the road. It can prevent you from doing things you really, really decide you want to do. Uh, uh, so, uh, I mean, you've demonstrated to me that you, you that you're thoughtful and that and that and that you're intelligent, um, and you have to make decisions that are good for you in the long run. And uh, I know at 18, the, the thought of compromise is an unacceptable reality. Um, but but think about what you're doing and think about why you're doing it. Uh, I hope we never see you here again. I I hope so too, but. Do you have some of my friends that have to come here, and I'll probably be here to support them. That that's fine. I mean, I am not telling you that you shouldn't support your friends. That's not that's not what I'm saying to you. I'm just saying to you that the the decisions you make have great impact on the rest of your life, and um, and and you need to think about that. that that's what I'm saying to you. Uh, all I can say is that, and I, I know your friends uh, are. are I don't know whether they're in this court or not in this court or they're coming to this court, but um, they made their own choices in their own, in their own lifestyle, but you've got to make choices for you. Uh, because if you come back and you're back here with the same sort of thing, I can assure you that the next time around, um, the judge won't be nearly as understanding because it will appear that that's what you've chosen to do. And there are, there are consequences to that kind of activity. There just are. Uh, and the next time, um, it could be longer suspended time, and the next time it could be jail. Uh, and it's not a nice place. It really isn't. I've heard. So I, I hope you'll make good choices, and I hope we don't see you. When I say not to see you here again, I mean where you're sitting. You can come and sit back there as many times as you want. I just don't want to see you sitting here again.